Hi, welcome to the garden at Chocolate Box Cottage. I want to show you what a real live garden looks like from a seed saver and preserving perspective. If you've seen other videos on garden tours, you've probably seen lots of fancy plants. But this is going to be a down to earth tour of an actual home garden. And I wanted to show you some of the what and why that I do so that you can adopt some of these principles for your garden too. The way I got interested in seed saving was as a young teen, my grandma gifted me some seeds that she had grown in her North Dakota garden for years and years and years before retiring to Oregon. And I didn't know anything about seed saving, so I didn't do a good job stewarding them. But I made it my business to learn, and I was introduced to the Seed Savers Exchange and learned the techniques for saving seeds. So now I'd just like to walk you through my garden and kind of explain what I have and why and what we do with some of these plants. So right here at our feet are some little bean seedlings. And you'll notice my plants are small. And this is because the garden has only been planted for, oh, I wanna say two and a half to three weeks. So everything is small, but that's how gardens start, the small beginnings. So these are beans that will be used in stir fries and we have another variety of beans a little distance away. And you might wonder why they're not right next to each other. Wouldn't that make sense? These beans here are great for pickling. Uh, dilly, dilly bean pickles, oh, those are so delicious. But the reason that I've separated the two varieties is although beans are self-pollinated, there is a little bit of risk of insects cross-pollinating the blossoms. So I like to keep them separate so that I can be sure that I'm saving pure seed at the end of the season. And the same goes with lots of other plants as we'll go through the garden. So we have two varieties of peppers that are interspersed with the beans. This is a pepper called, it's a jalapeno called Tangerine Dream. And it was a very popular pepper years ago. I wanna say maybe 20 years ago. It's an orange jalapeno that's not even commercially available anymore. And the reason for that is, is that new varieties are introduced all the time and old ones kind of fall by the wayside. But I have seeds, so I'm still growing it. This variety of pepper is one that I actually just bought some peppers at the grocery store. I liked the color and flavor and I saved the seeds and I've been planting them. So that's something that you can do too with peppers. Next, we have some tomatoes. These are called Thorburn's terracotta tomato. And the plants are small. Everything in this garden was raised from seed. But these plants will grow and they'll produce nice tomatoes that are about the color of a terracotta pot. So they're well named and they're great for making tomato sauce. I have grown this one for probably 20 years and they are not commercially available that I know of anymore. Next, we have several varieties of cucumbers, and oftentimes the seeds and the plants that you'll see in nurseries for cucumbers are for slicing cucumbers, which are great for salads and veggie sandwiches and that kind of thing. But they don't make the best pickles because they have too much water in them. The varieties that I'm growing are specifically for pickling. They're smaller, they have fewer seeds, and drier flesh. So they'll make wonderful pickles, whether I do the quick pickling method in a water bath, or if I ferment them the old fashioned way that my grandmother did in a crock with salt and lacto fermentation, they'll be wonderful. Let's take a look at this basil. We have several varieties of basil in the garden. I always grow four or five kinds. Again, they're not planted next to each other. It's not exactly perfect because they need a, a larger distance from each other to be absolutely certain that the seeds are going to be pure. But I found that from my garden out here in the mountains, this works just fine. And what about the milk jugs? Why are they under milk jugs? Well, these were raised from seeds and they are so tiny. They're less than an inch tall, but they'll grow and they'll produce basil that I will then dry and make and use in cooking. 
I dry it in the dehydrator, fill up jars like this, and then fill the small jar from my spice drawer and keep our household in basil all year long. The milk jugs protect these tiny little tender plants from pests overnight. So I generally take them off in the morning. The slugs and the earwigs really love to feast on basil, but the milk jugs help take care of that. This next variety of tomatoes is one that is still commercially available. You can find it at a few seed companies. It's called Japanese Black Truffel. And in spite of the name that sounds like it might be Japanese or French, it's believed to be from Russia. <laughs> It is a beautiful Bartlett pear size and shape, but a burgundy color with uh, dusky green shoulders. It is smooth and flavorful. It almost like has the, the fine texture of, of chocolate, if I were to describe it. It's a rather amazing tomato. Japanese black tree fell, and it makes great crush pack tomatoes in the canner. These are Italian, so I've added some basil and fennel seeds and herbs. A great meal starter in the kitchen. This is the zucchini or the summer squash area. We have yellow crookneck squash up front, which is wonderful, sauteed in a cast iron skillet with some onions and garlic. And it can also be grated and frozen, as can the zucchini. And these are grown from seed, and in order to save seed from them, you have to hand pollinate. So that is a skill that is maybe a separate video of how to hand pollinate squash. I have a few more that I've started later so that I can keep them growing through the summer and into fall. So they're just coming up, little babies. Great things come from small beginnings. This is another variety of peppers, a habanero that I grow from seed and they are wonderful for drying and for seasoning things like chilies and stews where you just need some punch of, of heat. Also great for salsa, of course. This is a tomatillo and it is called Amarilla. It bears beautiful, very large yellow tomatillos instead of the characteristic green. And they're much sweeter and more fruity tasting than any tomatillo I've ever tasted. I got the seeds from Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company a few years ago, and I've been saving seeds and growing them since. It makes a fabulous roasted tomatillo salsa verde that we love to can and have with nachos all winter long. And this next variety of peppers is special to me. It's called Blushing Beauty, and it was an All-America Selections winner in, I think, 2000, I wanna say. So it's been a number of years. It is a beautiful bell pepper that starts out ivory and ripens through shades of pink and orange and coral on its way to red. And it is the sweetest, prettiest pepper I've ever seen. It's every bit as pretty as a rose. But you know what? The seeds aren't available anymore. So if you don't have the seeds, if you haven't been saving the seeds, you can't grow this pepper. And that's one of the one of my heartfelt wishes about seed saving is that these varieties remain available to people. This actually was a, a filial one hybrid variety and I just kept saving seeds and stabilizing it, saving the best seeds year after year until I developed it into an open pollinated variety that bears true to type year after year. And when it comes to choosing varieties in your garden, I would always encourage you whenever possible to choose an open pollinated over a hybrid. It's so much easier to save seeds and keep that variety going. There's a tomato that my husband really loved called Lemon Boy. It's yellow, it's sweet, it's less acidic, and it was just more, more agreeable to him in flavor as well as didn't give him heartburn like some tomatoes do. He loved Lemon Boy, but it was a hybrid that uh, was a lot of work to maintain. I found another variety that is a, an open pollinated variety called Dad's Sunset at Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company and started growing that one and he likes it just as well. So I've been growing that one and saving seeds and we make tons and tons of fresh salsa in the summer with it. It also makes just beautiful crush packed tomatoes. Uh, just look at that color. This is Mexican 
herbs. So it's got some oregano, some cumin, a little bit of chopped chives, delicious starter for your Mexican dishes. And then I also like to make pizza sauce with it. Or no, this is tomato sauce. I spiced it with Italian herbs and made some, some small jars of tomato sauce for cooking. This right here is a special variety of watermelon. It is one that has come to the forefront of the heirloom seed saving movement. And, and it is called Moon and Stars Watermelon. It has these lovely yellow spots all over the leaves and when the fruit develop, there will be moons and stars on the fruit. Larger yellow spots that we would call moons and then smaller yellow dots that we'd refer to as stars. Both the plants and the fruit are beautiful. And this is something that was saved generation after generation by home gardeners or it wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Along this fence line of our vegetable garden is a solid wall of blackberries. And it's great because it is a place that we can keep them contained. If they try to encroach any further, we can just whack them back. And if you know anything about wild blackberries, you know their goal is to take over the world. So this helps us to really keep them under control and then also to enjoy the sweet bounty of berries that they offer. One of the ways that I like to preserve them is by making fruit leather. And I have a video on making homemade fruit leather that shows all the details on how to do this. It's also great to freeze extra berries for cobblers and pies and your morning oatmeal. They're just such a, a generous plant, but they do require a lot of maintenance. These potatoes are called German butterball and they produce a nice round shaped potato with a light ivory creamy yellow flesh that's just buttery and delicious. We save these from year to year. We save small potatoes for replanting even on a year when we don't have a fantastic harvest like last year our potato harvest was low. We made sure to set aside enough for replanting so that we can keep the variety going then we don't have to go back to the stores and buy more potatoes. You might not think of cabbage as being a very special vegetable, but when this grows and produces large heads with purple veins and shading on it, you'd be amazed. It really is a special vegetable, and not only is it great for cooking, it makes wonderful sauerkraut, wonderful kimchi, and it's very prolific, and it does really well in our climate. Our next variety is another tomato. I'm a tomato girl, can you tell? Love to grow tomatoes because there's so many varieties and so many colors. And I think every gardener has something that, that they probably favor in their garden. And so with me, it is tomatoes. This variety is called Japanese plum and it bears large pear sized fruit with a beautiful, I would say pinkish red color. It, they're very meaty, don't have a lot of seeds and they're great for canning. I have used up all of the crushed packed tomatoes that I canned with herbs from this variety because they're so delicious, but I do have some pizza sauce left. I make enough pizza sauce so that we can have a pizza every week throughout the year. So that means 52 little jars of pizza sauce will get us through the year. This variety is not available commercially anymore. I bought it years ago and I've been saving seeds and that's how it goes. So if you have a favorite variety, make sure that you're saving the seeds and learning how to, how to do that well so that you can keep pure seeds because otherwise these varieties are just gonna disappear. And there's always room for new things in a garden too. I always like to leave space to try something new. And when I say new, I really mean old. <laughs> so the two next varieties that I'm gonna show you are new to our garden, but they're not new varieties. They're ones that have been around for a long time. The first one is a sunflower that's called chocolate cherry. And as you can see, I got excellent germination, far better than I expected. I planted them more closely together than you normally would because the blue jays usually come through and pick off, oh, seven eighths of them. And this year, surprisingly, they have not bothered them much. So I probably have too many. This is a variety that has a purple stem and then the the flowers themselves will be just beautiful cherry red with chocolate cherry middles. So they're very well named. 
The birds love the seeds later on and they're also delicious for snacking or for making your own sunflower sprouts or growing into salad greens, which I have shown in one of my videos that I'll link below. I have a second variety of tomatillos and this one, I don't know if I can pronounce the name. It's called Chupon de Malinalco. I believe it's from South America. It's one that I'd heard about, an heirloom that I'd heard about. It grows a, about a three inch long, elongated yellow tomatillo with excellent flavor. This is my first year growing it. And I found seeds for it this year. There may never be seeds for it available again. So you can be sure I'm gonna save my own seeds from these plants, from the best looking plants, the ones that are most vigorous and with have the larger fruit so that I can keep this variety growing in my garden if we really like it. And I want to show you our salad bed. This is a long bed that runs along the center path of the garden and I just plant short rows of a lot of different things in it so that we can have salads for much of the year. I have kale, radishes, beets, carrots, lettuce, what's this, kohlrabi, more lettuce, chard, cilantro. There's from about April to November, considering the, the chard and kohlrabi, there will be something out here to eat, to put in our salad bowl and to saute in a cast iron skillet with a little garlic. You like sauteed greens? They're so delicious. I love having a variety of greens and many of these I save seeds for also. I have a couple varieties of radishes that are not available in the seed catalogs anymore that we really love. One is red and one is purple. And it's so easy to save seeds from plants like lettuce and radishes. You've got to try it. I have a couple more varieties of tomatoes, you guessed it, over by the rabbits. This one is one that I've actually developed myself called I call it pixie pumpkin and it makes a beautiful little bright orange pumpkin shaped tomato that I just cut them in half along their equators for drying and they do turn a little bit uh, more of a terracotta color in drying they start out bright orange but they're very delicious they reconstitute in hot water easily or in broth so you can add them to soups they're also just a really delicious snack at your desk and I've got one more unusual variety of tomatoes back here that are very tiny. This is one I've only been saving for a few years. They're called Sweet Raisin and it's from Israel. The seeds are really hard to get, but they're a little tiny grape-sized tomato that's more like aroma in texture. So they're, they're drier, they're less juicy, and they dehydrate really well. So this is all I have left after last year's bounty. This whole fence last year was covered with these tomato plants growing up and over the other side and they were loaded with fruit and I dried gallons of these tomatoes and this is all that's left. They're that good. Let's come on over to the garden teepee. My very sweet long-suffering husband built a new garden teepee for me this year. This one is made with oak poles and these were growing in our pasture they were knocked down when the power company took out some dead pine trees that were near a power line. So these were already, you know, they were already there and he, he took the, the branches off of them and single-handedly made, made and raised this teepee when I wasn't looking. I'm still not sure how he did that, <laughs> but here it is. And we just put a nylon clothesline on to make these ladder like rungs for plants to climb and over the course of the summer we'll have it completely covered in green. I plant vines all around the perimeter including some very rare gourds called mayo buell that produce these right here and these used to be used to make containers but they make great birdhouses too so my husband carves out a hole and we hang some in the trees for birdhouses. They're great. Also like to grow morning glories and moonflowers. These attract all kinds of pollinators, including some of the night moths like the hummingbird moths, as well as bumblebees and honeybees. 
We have kiwis that are just coming back from their winter sleep. And one of the most enjoyable parts of my garden is just watching everything start from ground zero and then progress over the course of the summer. The teepee makes a wonderful place to sit and have tea and coffee in the morning on weekends or sometimes on summer evenings we'll come out here and have dinner and just to be shaded by all the vines it's it feels like such a luxury experience and it just happens in our own garden. There are a few resources inside the teepee that I want to show you as pertains to learning to save your own seeds. And before I even start with that, let me encourage you to think about your garden from a perspective of what you're going to cook with the foods that you raise, how you're going to preserve those foods, and how you're going to save those seeds for perpetuation. A Seed Savers Exchange, which you can find online, is a wonderful resource for learning how to save seeds. They have video tutorials and all kinds of information to help you get started. A book because I love to have a book in hand when I go out to the garden that you might want to have is called Seed to Seed, Seed Saving and Growing Techniques for Vegetable Gardeners by Suzanne Ashworth. I had the original first edition and it went out to the garden with me and it was destroyed basically because it had mud and water on it. And that is just a testament to how useful I found it to be in the garden. The second one is all shiny and smooth. I'm taking better care of it, but <laughs> it shows the techniques for how to raise crops with seed saving in mind, how to place them in your garden as far as distance and how they're pollinated, whether it's by wind or by insects, or if you need to cross pollinate them to keep the variety pure. So everything from broccoli to squash to tomatoes and beans, peppers, okra, everything you can think of, the information's in here. This is a great handbook for getting started with seed saving. One that is newer to my seed saving shelf is this one, the Seed Garden, also produced by the Seed Savers Exchange. This is a, a big book. There's a lot of information in here, a lot of expanded information, and I would regard this as more of an intermediate to advanced textbook for seed saving. It has lots of beautiful color pictures, which I love. And I, I would say that this would be a good book to start with and then move on to this one as your interest and your expertise grow. Uh, the co-founder of Seed Savers Exchange, Kent Whaley, said years and years ago that his one wish for gardeners was that each one would start a card file of seeds that they're growing and varieties that they're maintaining. So I started doing that years ago and what that involves is is just taking a small box like this and filling it with index cards and dividers. So this is a, is a photo box that you can just find at any discount department store and some alphabetized dividers from an office supply store and then some, uh, these are just four by six recipe cards. So I write the name of the variety, where I find the seeds, uh, the Latin name also because that's important to know in seed saving, and then some notes which are really helpful to me about how it grew in my garden and just special things that I need to know when to start the seeds, about when to expect to harvest, and all those details that you think you'll remember, but you don't. It's really nice to have them written down. This is a great activity for winter when your garden is sleeping under the snow and there's less to do outside. It's nice to get caught up on your seed saving notes. And then of course there are the seeds themselves. This is a very low tech way of organizing your seed stash. I've got this divided in, in half with a piece of cardboard in the middle. One side is vegetable seeds, the other side is herbs and flowers, and whether they're seeds that I've saved myself or seeds that I've purchased, they can just be filed in here alphabetically. Here's one, this is a, the kale that I grow called wild garden kale mixture and it makes it easy to find what you need and then I also have seeds stashed in the freezer some of the really precious ones are are stored in the freezer so that I will have long-term storage with those 
I tend to raise things not every year, but rotate through different crops year by year so that I can maintain more, maintain more varieties that way. Well, these are some of the basic tools that will get you started with saving seeds and preserving food and making your food supply strong and resilient in your home garden. Thank you for joining me here today. I hope that this chat was inspirational and helps you look at your garden differently with different eyes so that you can see it not only as today, but how you can close that loop and bring your garden into a circle from saving the seeds to planting the seeds, growing the food, and then saving the seeds again, and perhaps even passing those seeds off to a child or a friend or someone else who can also grow and appreciate them. Thank you. I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.